On the 12th of June, 1933, one of the largest gatherings of politicians in the history of the world gathered in the unlikely venue of the Geological Museum in South Kensington. Delegates from 66 countries filled 708 seats of the World Monetary and Economic Conference. Discussions were aided, or possibly hindered, by the fact that there was a bar below the conference hall where delegates listed their preferred drinks. Though, as one British newspaper said, there was less chance of agreeing on world restoratives. The, the chances of success of this conference were considered to be rather low. Herbert Feiss, one of the US delegation at the conference, said it was, I quote, a cafeteria crush rather than a cohesive gathering with determined common purposes. And the conference did not find a solution to the economic problems facing the world in 1933. What it did instead was expose deep divisions and contested views of how to solve the first of three crises that I will be considering in my lectures this academic year. At the time of the third crisis, after the global financial crisis of 2008, Prime Minister Gordon Brown turned to 1933 as a warning when leaders of the world again assembled in London to consider a world economic crisis. As Gordon Brown said, <clears throat> there was a World Economic Conference in 1933 and it took place in Britain. People came to London to get agreement, partly on trade, partly on other aspects of the economy. It failed. And partly as a result of that failure, the rest of the 30s was blighted by protectionism. You can guess, of course, that he thought that he was going to succeed in 2009, where the 1933 conference failed. Well, the existence of a crisis in 1933 was not in doubt. The Great Depression remains a standard against which economic crises are still judged and from which lessons are drawn, rightly or wrongly, by politicians and economists. We can see from this graph that the conference was meeting at the low point of the Depression as trade, industrial production and agricultural production fell. In the United States, output dropped, or GDP dropped, by about 26 or 27 percent, and there was a high level of unemployment as well. What was in doubt was not the existence of a depression, what was in doubt was what to do about it. And the new administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which had only just come to office, was divided over what to do. So what was the American delegation to the conference in 1933 going to pr propose? Well, the answer to that is everything. Roosevelt, as always, pursued different options until things suddenly would crystallize. <clears throat> as he said of his own policy, he never let his right hand know what his left hand was doing. And this was seen by many people as being about indecision. A better way of seeing it is as competitive administration. He was allowed different departments, different officials to do different things, and then he would be the referee, and he would then decide which one eventually to adopt. It actually meant he had more power. He was the only person who would decide between the competitors. And underneath his competitive administration, his tactical shifts and stratagems, he did have a constant aim. When asked later in his presidency what was his main achievement, he said, saving American capitalism. American capitalism, he thought, rested on a mixture of free enterprise, individual rights, personal responsibility, and the dignity of work. 
and he thought that he achieved that task of saving capitalism, not so much by stimulating economic growth itself, as by removing social unrest, because he believed that social stability was a precondition for solving economic problems. And he knew when he took office in 1933 that if capitalism were to survive, it needed to be reformed because failure to act would play into the hands of two alternatives, Bolshevism, as Stalin was uh, uh, starting on his rapid industrialization of the Soviet Union, or fascism. But how to achieve that aim was not clear in 1933. The leader of the delegation to London from Washington was Secretary of, the St of State Cordell Hull. And he believed that the solution was free trade, to remove tariff barriers. He was little concerned about domestic policy. He stressed internationalism. To make America great meant acting on the world stage, not just at home. And free trade, he believed, would lead to both prosperity and to peace. As he said in his memoirs, unhampered trade dovetailed with peace. High tariffs, trade barriers, and unfair economic competition with war. If we could get a freer flow of trade, freer in the sense of, of fewer discriminations and obstructions, so that one country could not be deadly jealous of another and the living standards of all countries might rise, thereby eliminating the economic dissatisfaction that breeds war, we might have a reasonable chance of lasting peace. Well, Hull pressed that case of prosperity and peace in London. But other members of the delegation, including Roosevelt's leading advisors in the so-called Brains Trust, did not agree. As one American diplomat put it, foreign trade is a side porch to the solid structure of our domestic economy, ornamental but not structurally necessary. So he believed, that diplomat believed, that trade did not lead to prosperity and others doubted whether it would lead to peace. Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., remarked that Hull failed to realise that Japanese militarism and European fascism had released new and ugly forces which could not be controlled politely. So alongside Hull and his belief in free trade, there was another meeting taking place in London alongside the conference, a meeting of central bankers from the United States, Britain and France, meeting at the Bank of England in private to stabilise exchange rates between the dollar, the pound and the franc to end currency warfare. So Hull wanted to end trade warfare, the bankers wanted to end currency warfare. Britain had abandoned the gold standard in 1931. It devalued the pound, which made its exports more competitive, its imports more expensive. It hoped that that would stimulate recovery. France and the United States were still on the gold standard, as was Germany. And that meant that they were facing problems of international competitiveness. Their goods were more expensive than British goods because the pound was devalued. So Roosevelt wasn't quite sure what to do about this. Some of his advisers, like the banker James Warburg, believed in hard money, <clears throat> maintaining the value of the dollar, staying on gold, because the gold standard meant sound money, it meant stability. But in the United States, there were also people who were what were called silver bugs. They wanted to monetize silver, not only because places like Nevada produced silver, 
but also because if you added silver to the currency supply, it would increase prices. And farmers were suffering from low prices, and they were in debt, so they hoped that inflation would be beneficial to them, help them pay their mortgages, and help them to repay their debts. And the cry going back to the late, late 19th century was that the farmers were being, as William Jennings Bryan put it in the 1896 presidential election, they were being crucified on a cross of gold. So this goes back then to the late 19th century to populists. And in London, one of the silver bugs was present, Senator Pittman. Well, he spent most of the conference drunk um, and at one point was chasing Herbert Feist, whom I quoted earlier on, around the luxury hotel in London, brandishing a gun. Um, the fact that he wore yellow shoes at the reception of Buckingham Palace was not seen as a good sign either. So we have this hard money versus soft money um, approach going on here. Roosevelt was very alert to the pressures domestically at home, including from uh, the leading populist campaigner of the time, uh, Father Coughlin, who wanted to drive out the money changers. Father Coughlin uh, called for an end to the tyranny of the gold standard. In February 1933, he had a broadcast on banks and gold, which attacked Wall Street bankers who, without either the blood of patriotism or of Christianity flowing in their veins, have shackled the lives of men and of nations with the ponderous links of their golden chains. So, which does Roosevelt believe? Does he believe in soft money? Does he believe in hard money? Does he believe in free trade? People were puzzled. And competing for influence in London with Hull, the official leader of the delegation, was Raymond Moley, uh, the leading member of Roosevelt's Brains Trust. And Moley said that he was working intensively on a programme of domestic recovery which depended utterly on non-interference from outside. We were temporary isolationists. He wanted a domestic policy which will put our house in order, to quote Moley. So Roosevelt here had both nationalist and internationalist ideas, developing them simultaneously, being fought out in London with a delegation which covered all positions on how to solve the problems of the global economy. But then, during the conference, his views crystallised. He spent most of the conference on his yacht, Amberjack. Um, as you see there, he is um, waving to the, the uh, press reporters. And on the way back from his holiday on Amberjack, on a US naval vessel, he sent what was called his bombshell on the 3rd of July, 1933. It would, he said, be a catastrophe amounting to a world tragedy if the conference was, and I quote, diverted by the pr proposal of a purely artificial and temporary experiment affecting the monetary exchange of a few nations only. This is the secret meetings, the private meetings in the Bank of England. After all, in his inaugural um, address in March 1933, he said he was going to drive the money changes from the temple of our civilization mimicking uh, Coughlin. And he said in this bombshell message that he was going to reject the old fetishes of so-called international bankers. His priorities lay at home, which meant rejecting Warburg's concern for monetary stability and also Hull's concern for opening up international trade. What he did was embark on aggressive devaluation of the dollar. He took the dollar off the gold standard. He wanted to make prices rise. 
Now, why did he want to do that? He had a long interest in unorthodox monetary policies, which went back to the late 19th century. But he was also picking up on a modern economic theory, that of a famous economist at the University of Chicago, Irving Fisher, who wrote an article about what he thought caused the Depression. What Fisher said was that when prices were falling, people would delay buying goods. Why buy something now if it's going to be cheaper in a few months' time? That then meant that there was deflation in the economy. So you have debt, you have deflation, you have depression. The only way to break that cycle, obviously prices are dropping, your debt level is going up in real terms, the only way to break that cycle is by raising prices by an active monetary policy. And those views were reinforced by somebody called George Warren. George Warren was an expert on farm management. And he advised Roosevelt and Henry Morgenthau both of whom were neighbours with farms in the Hudson Valley. So Warren would go along on a sort of, almost a daily basis to these two key figures, advising them on planting trees, but also on the fact that the solution to the, uh, the depression was to increase prices. Warren went off to Germany, and he came back and he said to Roosevelt, your choice is between increasing prices to stimulate recovery, to break this debt deflation cycle, or dictators. He said Hitler was the product of deflation, and that undermined democratic institutions. Roosevelt's new approach to try and increase prices by this active monetary policy horrified Warburg and Wall Street. In 1934, Warburg said that Roosevelt was like an incompetent doctor. I quote, in seeking to, to cure an infected toe, he has come perilously close to amputating the whole leg. So he's destroying what he's trying to save, he's destroying capitalism. Well, Roosevelt's decision to uh, devalue the, the dollar come off the gold standard, cleared the way for easy money to raise prices to break the cycle of debt, deflation, and depression. But what the decision did, the bombshell did, more immediately, was sink the conference. The British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Neville Chamberlain, said there was, has never been a case of a conference being so completely smashed by one of its participants. Well, okay, he did smash it by the bombshell, but would it have worked anyway? Well, I doubt it, because the other participants could not agree on their solution either. Let's look at what the British wanted to do. This is the, the national government after the uh, crisis of 1931, coming off the gold standard. And one thing that the national government did in 1931-32 was adopt imperial preference. That is, preferential treatment on goods from the British Empire. Neville Chamberlain uh, uh, stressed that this was essential to British economic recovery. It entailed a rejection of free trade, the creation of a trade bloc, and this was appalling as far as Hull was concerned. Tariffs are bad, he believed, but at least they apply to everybody generally. Imperial preference is even worse because it puts tariffs on some countries, America, not on other countries, Canada. So it leads to distortion of trade and to inefficiency, according to Hull. And more than that, Roosevelt was also deeply suspicious of European colonies in general. So imperial preference. And then on money, as I've already said, uh, there is the abandonment of the gold standard in 1931. To many people, this was a 
a, a liberation. Going back onto the gold standard by Winston Churchill in 1925 had needed deflation. British prices were out of line with the rest of the world. They had to be brought down. Bringing the prices down meant unemployment, the general strike of 1926, uh, and, and so on. So the gold standard in Britain became associated with depression, unemployment, and political unrest. Coming off gold meant that the pounds could be held down, which meant British exports were cheaper, imports became more expensive, but you could also have low interest rates because you now did not need to defend the value of the pound. That stimulated house building recovery and it was seen as a, a very beneficial thing indeed. So the British policy was imperial preference for tariffs plus soft money, stimulating recovery in the 1930s, which it did, but of course it was also leading to trade warfare, currency warfare with other countries to what was known as beggar my neighbour. And the third element of the policy, which was expressed at the World Conference in 1933, was war debt. Britain had very large debts to the United States of America, and it had been agreed that one thing that would not be talked about was war debt. So what did Ramsay MacDonald, the Prime Minister, do in his opening speech? He talked about war debt. In December 1931, the United States Congress resolved, and I quote, it was against the policy of Congress that any of the indebtedness of foreign countries to the United States should in any manner be cancelled or reduced. Well, the British during the conference said we're only going to make a token payment. And then they defaulted. So, of course, that is really immediately going to sink the, the conference, whatever Roosevelt did. And there's the imperial preference. If you want to have an empire Christmas pudding, that's what you do. One political commentator in vaudeville turn, Will Rogers, there in his cowboy outfit, outfit wrote in his column that the only reason for the conference was for the Europeans to renege on their debts. And if things don't pick up in their own countries, they'll think of something else to blame America for and have another conference. So there's huge resentment in the United States of America about the British as unreliable and duplicitous, which of course is going to affect um, Lend-Lease, the giving of money to Britain during the, during the war. The French, unlike Britain, were committed to the gold standard. Whereas the gold standard of Britain seemed to have led to political and economic and social problems in the 1920s, in France it looked like going on to gold, they went back in 1928, solved their problems. To them it looked as if the gold standard was much more about restoring a period of instability and political disorder. It meant restoring confidence in the franc and in uh, the French economy. So the French policy was one of hard money and tariffs. So again, they all have different solutions. The final party in the conference I just want to mention is Germany. Now this is a serious problem because Hitler had become Chancellor of Germany in January 1933 in a coalition with far-right parties. And one reason for the growing success of the Nazi party up to uh, January 1933 was an economic crisis that hit Germany in 1931. There was a banking crisis in Germany in 1931. Germany had massive debts arising from reparations, but also local government, state government, central government had borrowed very heavily in the late 1920s, particularly from banks in New York. The New York bankers thought they could get higher interest rates by lend lending to Germany than at, than at home. When recession hit Germany in 1929, there's a problem of how to service this debt, how to repay it, how to pay the interest. 
And the result of that was that the government of Bruning and the Weimar Republic had to try and increase their budgetary surplus. And that meant cutting wages, cutting public spending, imposing higher taxes. But because that all seemed to be the fault of foreigners who had lent the money, of course, it was very easy for Hitler to say it's all the fault of these foreigners. It plays into the hands of nationalists. It was very difficult to get these measures through the Reichstag. And, of course, even the democratic parties, uh, the moderate parties, also believed that the fault was, belonged to the foreigners who had imposed these massive debts upon, upon Germany. It was only possible to get the measures through the Reichstag by using emergency decrees, which then, of course, undermines the, the legitimacy of the Reichstag. So Hitler coming to power was very closely associated with this problem of austerity and foreign debt. Hitler himself didn't go to uh, the, the conference in London in 1933. And what he wanted to do was send somebody, a, a career diplomat who was now the foreign minister along, to make it look as if Germany was not a threat. He didn't want Germany to be, at this stage, isolated or sanctioned in any way, particularly because at the same time there's the World Disarmament Conference in Geneva where people were very concerned about German policy for rearmament. So he didn't want to upset the uh, international community anymore. But there was one person who went along to London, Hugenberg, not a Nazi, but a leader of a far-right party in the coalition. He was the economics minister. And he really upset that strategy of Hitler by saying at the conference that the aim was to have German colonies restored to it, the ones which had lost during the First World War, and to uh, embark on colonial expansion in Eastern Europe and Africa. Well, Hitler immediately disavowed him, because he, that's what he thought, of course, but he didn't want anybody to say it. Um, and it upset the diplomat, who was the head of the delegation. Between these, if you like, the moderate and the extreme, was Schacht, who was Hitler's economic advisor. Uh, he, had be, he was president of the Reichsbank. He became the economic minister in the Third Reich, after Hugenberg. He was a very cunning, clever uh, participant in London. What he was doing was not part of the official delegation. He was negotiating with London bankers a deal on the German debts to the London bankers. He struck a deal with the London bankers about repaying of the debt, uh, what the interest rate should be, which was better than the deal that was being offered to the Americans. So what he was immediately doing was splitting the Americans and the British and trying to link, as Hitler thought, the British Empire with the Third Reich. So there's, as you see, a lot of geopolitical and economic manoeuvring going on here. Now, Schacht became economic minister when Hugenberg was sacked on his return to Berlin. And Schacht believed in, well, what it became known as Schachtianism during the Second World War, creating a, a trade bloc around Germany, bilateral trade with other countries, a, like a barter agreement with other countries, trying to create a trade bloc within, within Europe. So the world is shifting to self-contained blocks, the British Empire, Japan and its so-called co-prosperity sphere after the invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Germany with its bilateral system of Shaktianism and, of course, the Soviet Union as completely self-contained, uh, rapidly industrialising under Stalin. Well, you can imagine the conference fails. Here we are at the depth of the Depression. Nobody can agree. 
Uh, we won't talk about COP26, but you can understand how trying to get solutions at international conferences is incredibly difficult. The conference failed. It was a triumph of nationalism over internationalism. And here in London, the economists summed up the conference. Faced by the greatest economic crisis of recent, recent history, the effective solution of which can, by general consent, only be achieved by international action, one country after another has, by its attitude, placed obstacles in the way of the formulation of an international plan. So internationalism is defeated by economic nationalism, the world economy seemed to be spiralling out of control, and more than that, from what I've been saying, economic warfare might lead to real warfare, as the liberal capitalist democracies faced the authoritarian systems of the Soviet Union, Germany, Italy and Japan. Rebuilding capitalism, saving capitalism, would be closely allied with a geopolitical strategy to face up to these authoritarian regimes. And that's what Hitler, sorry, beg your pardon, that's what Roosevelt embarked on against Hitler. But he believed that the first thing to do was to save capitalism at home. So it's if like short-term domestic priority rather than, if you like, what we later on see with another president, long-term uh, domestic priority. Now, he had a problem. If you're going to break the debt depression deflation cycle by increasing prices, that would benefit farmers who are suffering from the low prices. But what about the consumers? People who are unemployed. They don't want to be paying higher prices for their foodstuffs and so on. So they're going to be affected. So there were two problems with the policy that he, that he was adopting of increasing prices. One was international instability by constantly deflating, devaluing the dollar. Other countries might follow that in a beggar my neighbor policy. And secondly, high prices hitting wage earners. So this easy money solution was not sufficient. He also realised he needs to increase purchasing power. And how does he do that? Well, the key to this is by giving power to women, in part. Women are shoppers, as you see. Women do 85% of the buying. The national... Um, NRA, National Recovery Administration, had this Blue Eagle scheme. The, the shops and various retailers selling goods would pledge themselves to be paying decent wages, fair prices, and the women shoppers would enforce it. So you're mobilising the house, housewife to try and create fair prices and fair wages. That has then taken a stage further in 1935 by giving, for the first time, collective bargaining power to trade unions under the National Labour Relations Act of 1935. Legal right to workers to join trade unions and to engage in collective bargaining. That would allow workers to increase their wages, to increase consumption. Unions were allied with housewives to create more purchasing power. And also, you would then use other policies, taxation and so on, to increase purchasing power by redistribution. This is a, a chart of the level of inequality in America, and you see inequality drops radically during the New Deal era. So, increase the consuming power, that will stimulate recovery. So by, that, by these means, American capitalism was remade to save it from its critics at home. But the next stage was to extend that overseas, because Roosevelt realised democratic capitalism would not be safe only within America. It meant international action. 
And this meant turning to two policies. One was associated with Hull, and the other one with Morgenthau. And the first one is the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act of 1934. So Hull came back looking like a defeated man from London. He went off to Montevideo to take part in um, a, a conference, a Pan-American conference, which was purportedly about building a Pan-American highway. But he used this as a way of saying America, building upon the good neighbour policy, which Roosevelt had put forward in 1933, will build prosperity within the Western Hemisphere. The good neighbour, America and Latin America, would be good neighbours to stimulate recovery. And then, in 1934, Roosevelt agreed to pass the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act, which would allow countries to negotiate with America to reduce their trade barriers. Now, this would be done by America negotiating with one country, striking a deal, so A with B, and then if country B then made a deal with country C, whatever the, the terms of B to C were, would be given to A as well. Okay, so bilateral deals cascading to improve the whole trade of the world. This is known as the most favoured nation agreement. Whatever you give to one country, you must give to every other country. Every country will be most favoured. And this will lead to a recovery of trade. But he also believed that that would link countries together in a democratic world against Schacht. As he said, this, if we could get all the commercial nations in agreement on liberalising and increasing trade, removing trade restrictions and eliminating discrimination, then with nearly 40 nations banded together on economic grounds, we can show the calcitrant nations like Germany and Italy the undoubted benefits of joining in the same movement. So it's a geopolitical strategy as well as an economic strategy. And the second strategy is that of Morgenthau. In 1936, he agreed that the United States, France and Britain would stabilise their currencies. Rather than trying to compete all the time to steal an advantage by devaluing one country against another, they would stabilise. And that was uh, agreed in 1936. And Morgenthau assured Neville Chamberlain, who was now Prime Minister in Britain, that this was the greatest move taken for peace in the world since the World War. It may be the turning point for again resuming rational thinking in Europe. It may be just the thing to again bring reason back to these perfectly mad people. That's the Germans. Let's hope so. After all, we are the only three liberal governments left. So stabilising currency would, they hoped, end currency warfare and, and, and economic instability. But more than that, it would unify democratic capitalists against totalitarian regimes to, as Morgenthau said, safeguard peace. So during these dark days of the 1930s, there's already the beginning of signs of how to bring the, the democratic capitalist nations together to restore the world economy and to face down authoritarian regimes. The point, though, that, that Morgan Thor made in 1936 was that the agreement to stabilise the currencies was a gentleman's agreement. He said to, um, to Chamberlain, it's in good faith. We have confidence in each other, and I would ten times rather shake hands than have all the signatures in the world. Now, during the Second World War, that changes. In the Second World War, we do have signatures. We do have agreements which are formally binding and impose rules. Uh, and that is the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, which set up the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, 
and in the post-war war meetings, which led to the general agreement on trade and tariffs in 1947. These deals are all still with us. The International Bank is now the World Bank, and GATT, the general agreement, has become part of the World Trade Organization. This is what was called embedded liberalism. It's embedding the liberal order in a rules-based regime to stop people undermining each other, as they had in the 1930s. Well, here we have Bretton Woods, where in 1944, 45 nations gathered together to set up the, the IMF. And the deal was struck between, really, John Maynard Keynes for Britain and Harry Dexter White for the United States of America. A story about how they came to uh, an agreement has been told many times, and I won't repeat it now. But let's just say that the starting point for the uh, Keynes's plan in September 1941 was a request that he give a radio address to attack the, the um, policy of Germany, of, of Funk, who was now the economic minister in succession to Schacht. Funk wanted to create a new order in Europe, which is basically to have Germany at the centre of the European economy and to have a clearing union between different parts of, of uh, the, the European economy. So uh, the deficit of one country would be offset against the surplus of another country. They would all be cleared. It would all be self-balancing because it would all be planned directly from Berlin. And Hitler wanted to set up that sort of policy. Keynes said, well, there's some good ideas in here, but it's totalitarian and it's planned. I want to come up with a better plan. And his better plan was eventually what became the International Monetary Fund. What he did not agree with Funk about was that all credit balances and debt paid balance would, would self rectify at the end. There might, one country might still end up with a deficit which had to be balanced, and that would be the role of the IMF. So you're going to try and now stabilise the whole economy by having this uh, international monetary fund to help out the debtor, debtor nation. Uh, so it would be a rules-based regime. It would also mean that you would be able to have a domestic policy free of international considerations to some extent because he would not allow capital flows. He believed that capital mobility was destabilizing. So it was based upon having stability within the currency system. You would peg the currencies to the dollar, which would be pegged to gold, that would be stable. But the countries, if they were in crisis, could devalue their currency against the dollar. So you had some flexibility within a stable system, and you would also block capital flows which were destabilizing. So finance was to be subordinated to domestic stability. So he's trying to balance uh, internationalism and nationalism. And the white scheme was put, was put forward at the request of Henry Morgenthau at the US Treasury. And this was largely building upon what was happening in Latin America. Harry Dexter White had been involved with the stabilization scheme of 1936, but he was also involved in the good neighbor policy in Latin America. And what he wanted to do was to spread the prosperity of the good neighbour policy from Latin America to the rest of the world. In fact, he wanted to put forward his scheme in Rio de Janeiro in 1942. He was seeing it as a Western Hemisphere-based prosperity zone. Morgenthau assured Roosevelt that White's plan was a new deal in international economics to eliminate poverty worldwide. And Roosevelt said in June 1943, I do want to get across the idea that the economy and social welfare 
of Jesus Fernandes in Brazil does affect the economic and social welfare of Johnny Jones in Indiana. So, in other words, to create in, uh, domestic prosperity, you have to create this international prosperity. So, the Bretton Woods scheme uh, succeeded for various reasons. The first reason is they did not go for the cafeteria crush of London. The deal was struck by Keynes and White and their technical experts almost in private. Once they got a deal, they then engaged other countries at Bretton Woods, but it was a prepared scheme where technical issues had been thrashed out. Also, it did not deal with everything together at the same time, like they tried to do in London in 1933. It only dealt with money. Once you solve that, then you can move on to the next issue, which might be trade. Monetary issues were technical and less politically divisive than trade, because after all, with the trade, Churchill didn't want to talk about it in the cabinet because you had some people who were imperial preference supporters and other people who were free traders. So the last thing he wanted to do was to split his own coalition, get the war over first. And in any case, the monetary system is closed down during the war. It's easy to mend something when it's not actually working. So what we have then, coming out of Bretton Woods, is, just to recap what I said, Exchange rates are pegged, but flexible. In crisis, you can change them. Capital movements to be controlled as destabilizing. Finance is dangerous. You don't want to have a financialized economy. And thirdly, there would be assistance from the IMF to countries in crisis. Now, what Roosevelt also wanted to do was to add to the mix the Soviet Union and China, because he believed after the war there would be the four policemen running the world. America would be running the, uh, the, the Americas. Britain would be running Europe, alongside the, its, own, its own empire, having replaced Germany. China would take over the role of Japan in, in Asia, and the Soviet Union would run its sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union itself. So he, and then America would be the umpire between all of them. Well, as we know, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, he tried to get uh, the Soviet Union on board at, uh, at the IMF, but as one person on the American delegation said, they were caught between two enemies, the English language and the firing squad back home in Moscow. So he's trying to get the whole world together, but it ends up, in fact, that the IMF and the, uh, the trade deal is only these liberal democratic economies. And the final point on that is what happens with trade. When the war finished, talks did, did start on trade, how to solve the trade issue, and it was hoped that there would be an international trade organisation to parallel the IMF. And this was building upon the ideas of, uh, of Hull, uh, led, who had now retired from ill health in 1945, led by William Clayton, who was, like Hull, a southerner, uh, a Democrat. Uh, he was a cotton merchant. But the problem now is, now that the war is over, the voices of what were to become the third world are being heard. Well, it starts off with Australia because the Australians believed if they sign up to the IMF, if they sign up to an open world economy, they might be hammered again as they were in the 30s by a collapse of the price of their raw materials, of their wool and so on. So they say we will only sign up to the IMF if the Americans agree that there should be a full employment of all the resources of the world. They press that. And in fact, the post-war trade talks were about trade and employment. Well, the Americans started to think, mm, this sounds a little bit like socialism. Not sure we quite want this sort of full employment policy, which might mean planning and regulation and, and deficit finance. So there's a bit of a standoff there. 
And then the Indians come in. Although India was not yet independent, the Congress party was being represented in these talks. And they say, we want to develop. And if we're going to develop, that might mean that Britain will have to suffer. There might have to be unemployment in Britain because we're going to develop our own industry and not for your markets. Well, that's not going to play very well in London. And then the final conference of this round of talks is in Havana. The Latin Americans turn up and they say, well, yeah, we'll sign up to free trade on condition that we can impose it tariffs on American and British goods, if we can have preference zones within our own area, exactly what Hull did not want, and if we can have quantitative restrictions, you know, actually import controls on goods coming from outside. Well, Clayton signed a charter for the International Trade Agreement, having given in to all of these other people. You then take it back to the capital, and they say, what on earth have you done? You've sold out. You've sold America down the river. So this was never agreed, the International Trade Organization. What is left is GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which is basically to reduce trade barriers on industrial goods amongst industrial countries. So again, it becomes an embedding of liberalism amongst a smaller group of countries. Now, what does this all lead to? It leads to reformed capitalism. Capitalism survived the crisis of the 1930s, survived the low point of the conference with which I started. It was transformed and reformed until a new crisis emerges in the 1970s, which I'll be talking about in my next lecture. The features of this reformed capitalism, which lasted for the 30 years after the Second World War, is a balance between international and domestic economic concerns. You stop beggar my neighbour economic nationalism, but you do not go back to the old days of the gold standard where domestic policy was sacrificed to international issues. You create stability of exchange rates with some flexibility, and you control capital. In other words, you have thrown finance out of the temple of our civilization, which is what Roosevelt wanted to do. You've created a social contract between capital, labour and the state, providing welfare and decent wages for workers. Labour workers then agreeing to moderate their wage demands so that there can be investment in better productivity, which can pay higher wages. Inequality has been reduced, as we saw in that graph, which boosts consumption and creates a sense of equity. There's an economy which is based upon steady work for people who don't necessarily have any uh, formal skills, people working in the car plants of Detroit or Coventry um, or Turin, steady, regular work with, with uh, uh, decent pensions and, and conditions. And this means that the whole ideas of democratic capitalism are then uh, supported widely and are embedded in the international institutions which I we're talking about. But it all falls apart in the 1970s. I'll just say that we will find out next time what goes wrong. Well, partly it's because the countries which have been excluded at Havana say, we want to be part of this club. Eventually, that's going to lead to the oil shock of 1973. It's their call starting at Bandung in 1955 leading through to the 1970s, they want a new international economic order. How is that going to be dealt with? That's one shock. Also, productivity slows down. If productivity slows down, you can't give up both higher wages and keep prices low and have decent profits. Something has to give. There's also the return of finance. By the late 60s, international finance is picking up, that starts to undermine the agreements that I set out. And once that, those agreements are undermined, then you can have even more financialization. So we have a new type of capitalism which is more financialized. And also, of course, the economy itself changes 
with those car plants that I was talking about, suddenly discovering that they are not actually as profitable and as stable as one might have imagined. Deindustrialization starts. So we have a second crisis of capitalism in the 1970s, which then has to be remade. And I think that we all, well, I, I remember Mrs. Thatcher being elected in 1979 and President Reagan. We have a new world of market liberalism. Now, I'll talk about how that come, came about next time. Thank you. You said that the four policemen were envisaged as responsible for the Americas, Europe, the Far East. Can I, can I check, can I? The four policemen yes. were envisaged as responsible for the Americas, Europe, and the Far yeah. East. What about Africa and the Indian subcontinent or Australia? Where did they fit in? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a good question because... Um, <clears throat> There's, I mean, Af Africa, of course, at this stage is largely still part of the colonies, uh, col colonised. It's not until the 1960s you could get uh, decolonisation. So um, it really there fits within the, in fact, the British European zone. Um, and one of the policies, which I think is now not really talked about so much, is the idea after the war that you would have your Africa. So the, the argument, particularly amongst the French, but it's also true of Britain, some of us who have a certain age remember the groundnut scheme in, in, uh, in, in West Africa, is to say that um, America had a hinterland, resources in, its, in, in the West. Europe needs a hinterland as well, <clears throat> and that will be Africa. So you have this, um, this discussion about what, what the role of Europe should be with, with, within Africa. That links in with Algeria crisis and so on. Um, India... Um, that's an interesting one because, of course, during the time I'm talking, talking about, India is still part of the British Empire, the Raj, but it's clear it's going to become uh, independent at some point after, after the war. And the, um, the Congress was being represented um, at the conferences, uh, if I, almost apart from the British government representatives for, for, for India. I think that Roosevelt was in a slight quandary of, over this. You don't want, as I said, he was anti-colonial, anti but he didn't want to upset the British too much because they're also allies during the, the war. So you know, I think that it's, it's, this is part of his, if I, I'm not going to say slipperiness, or his juggler uh, I issue. They wanted India to become independent. But still, the biggest delegation at Bretton Woods was China, you know, nationalist China. Um, so who is going to take the lead in, 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 in Asia? Is it going to be the Chinese? Of course, then, you know, Chiang Kai-shek is seen as a rather weak figure. So the four policemen discussion uh, is very, very difficult. And... Um, it also leads to tension over the Soviet Union, because I said the Morgenthau wanted the Soviets uh, inside the IMF. Harry Dexter White, I don't think I pointed out in the lecture, was a Soviet agent. Um, and it's really the British who are leading to the intensification of what became the Cold War, particularly after the war, Ernie Bevin. So you can't trust these people because Ernie Bevan had dealt with communists within the Transport and General Workers Union. He, he knew what they were like, but don't trust them. Um, and he's still pushing um, Roosevelt and, uh, and, and Harry Truman uh, to say, no, don't, don't have truck with them. So uh, the four policemen is, is a great idea, but of course uh, it's rhetoric, uh, which then com comes up against the practicalities at the end of the war. You mentioned about de uh, the destabilizing effect. You know, there was the the destabilizing this. Yes. The, now, uh, was that due largely because John Maynard Keynes was not uh, uh, taken seriously, you know, at the Treaty of Versailles? That's one yeah. thing. And secondly, after the Second World War, uh, you didn't mention about the martial aid, yeah. which which uh, helped to recap yeah. the game. How did that fit in? in okay. Terms? Yes, well, uh, the answer to that is, of course, that uh, I was, as you might have noticed, I was editing as I, as I, I went along a bit. There's so much to get in. Uh, martial aid is, is a very um, important um, theme. Um, 
the, the problem that the Americans had at Bretton Woods is that they thought that the restoration of order, stability at the end of the war would come very quickly. They wanted to force convertibility of all currencies almost immediately after the war. And in fact, they, uh, Britain tried to do it, didn't it, in 1947, and it failed under American pressure. And it was really um, people like Will Clayton came to, came to Europe and said, actually, it's in a mess. It's worse than we thought. We've got to provide some, some assistance here. And there seems there to be a contradiction if you're providing assistance and martial aid to Europe, that could be creating a trade zone, which would be like the sort of preferential system, which Hull didn't like. And, and the Americans, in their internal documents, said, we're going to be accused of inconsistency here. Uh, to which the answer was, well, yes, but uh, is it better to be inconsistent or is it better to actually try and have restoration of the uh, European economy. And Clayton said, in fact, that the international trade organization he was trying to set up was, com was complemented by martial aid because only when you get a customs union going within Europe that you could then build upon that and then take down those tariff barriers and open up. Of course, then the issue is, well, hmm, is, is, the Europe, is, it, is it going to become a closed Europe? Now, that's going to be in my next lecture because by the 1960s and 70s, the Americans start to think that they've created this monster called the, um, a European trade bloc, which is, which is threatening them. So I think this, that's a very, very complicated uh, story to, to tell. Uh, you said about Keynes. Uh, did Keynes... Yes, yeah, I mean, during... Uh, after the end of the first world war, the reparations. Yeah, um, well, that, that, I mean, that, that again is, a very, is another very interesting I issue because at the end of the Second World War, um, our friend um, Henry Morgenthau had the Morgenthau plan, which in a way goes back to the four policemen idea. He wanted to completely deindustrialize Germany. So they would never engage in the Third, third World War. He was from a, um, a German Jewish background himself. He tried to rescue uh, German Jews. He tried to force Roosevelt to take, to take action. And he said, I don't care if the Germans starve. They're not going to have another war. Um, Keynes was appalled by that because he said that, as in, he argued at the end of the First World War, you're not going to have recovery in Europe if Germany doesn't have economic recovery. So Morgenthau wanted to turn um, Germany into what one of his colleagues called a cabbage patch. And Keynes said, no, this is mad, because uh, the British zone was the rule, after all. Uh, we'll be, um, what will we do? We'll be handing out you know, food parcels to, to Germany, when it should be the powerhouse to lead to the recovery of, uh, of Europe. Of course, they wanted to demilitarize Germany. So the, you know, the argument about the post-First World War reparations is still played out in, after the Second World War, and Keynes is referring back, of course, to um, his famous book on the economic consequences of the peace. Um, the French thought that Keynes was dangerous, that he actually caused the Second World War by telling the Germans they couldn't afford to pay the reparations. So a chap called Henri Montu uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of Mr. Keynes, uh, which is not, not good uh, in, in, his, in his view. But yeah, so I think that there's, there's a whole, uh, whole set of other issues in, in there. If I were being blatant, I would plug my book, which is coming out on this, which covers all of those, those, those points. But you'd have to wait until uh, another year in the transcript <laughs> <laughs> as forthcoming, yes. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't, alas. I wanted to thank you once again for a wonderful lecture, um, and please join me. Thank you.